Hello, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Ryan Hardesty and I am the Interim Executive Director here at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at Washington State University. I want to thank you for joining us uh, from wherever you may be this evening. And let's begin by acknowledging the Washington State University Pullman campus is located on the homelands of the Nimipu tribe and the Palouse people. We acknowledge their presence here since time immemorial and recognize their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. We couldn't be more thrilled to offer this live stream program this evening entitled Teaching Through Talking, How Betty Thieves' Ceramics Reveal Historic Shifts in Art Education. The museum's current exhibition, Betty Thieves, The Earth Itself, which surrounds me in this gallery, and this evening's program were made possible through the support of Alan and Lori Thieves, the Samuel H. and Patricia W. Smith Endowment, Patrick and Elizabeth Seiler, and the many members of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. Uh, we cannot thank the Thieves family enough for their ongoing support throughout this project. And likewise, this exhibition's education framework um, would not have been made possible without the guidance and scholarship of Namita Gupta Wiggers, our special guest this evening. Thank you, Namita. I'd like to now turn to Kristen Becker, the museum's education coordinator who has organized today's program and who will introduce our special guests. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to uh, extend a really warm welcome to Namita Gupta Wiggers, who is joining us tonight. Um, Namita is an artist, a curator, an educator, and a writer based in Portland, Oregon. She's the founding director of the MA in Craft Studies at Warren Wilson College, which is in North Carolina. And this is the first low residency program focused on craft history and theory. <laughs> Wiggers also co-founded and directs the Critical Craft Forum, which is an online and on-site platform for exchange. It has a growing membership of 13,500 international participants through Facebook, iTunes, Instagram, and of course, a decade of sessions at the College Art Association. Uh, Namita Gupta Wiggers has served as the chief curator and director for the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland. That was from 2004 to 2014. And she's the first American of South Asian heritage to direct a non ethnically focused art museum in the US. So uh, Ryan mentioned that Namita is responsible for the foundational scholarship for our exhibition, Betty Phoebus, The Earth Itself. Uh, Namita curated an exhibition and edited a, and contributed to a, a, a publication that went along with the exhibition called Betty Phoebus Generations at the Museum of Contemporary Craft in partner with, partnership with the Pacific Northwest College of Art in 2012. And so uh, that work was really crucial in informing our exhibition, Betty Phoebus, The Earth Itself. So Namita is going to give us some wonderful insight tonight into her work um, on Betty Phoebus. So uh, one comment before we let Namita begin her talk, we are going to, we have our chat function open to all of our attendees tonight. So you should be able to open the chat function in Zoom and, uh, we welcome your questions and comments throughout the talk. I will be moderating them. And then when Namita is done speaking, we've invited Squeak Meisel, the current director chair of our fine arts department at uh, Washington State University, kind of the, you know, the current iteration of what Betty Phoebus experienced almost 100 years ago when she studied fine arts at Washington State College. So Squeak will be joining us at the end, um, but we'll also moderate some of your questions. So please feel free to participate in that. So without further delay, welcome to Namita Gupta Wiggers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen and Ryan. And um, I'm going to just share my screen here. It's just taking a second to load up here. All right. Kristen, is that all set? It looks great, Namita. Okay, great, great. Well, thank you. So um, thanks everybody for joining this evening and, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, you may not be aware that Betty Fevis's work and her life is impacting you right now. 
Uh, if you studied music in the state, particularly in Pendleton, Oregon and the surrounding areas, Betty Phoebus helped put that in place. If you have visited Crow's Shadow or viewed or purchased prints by artists creating work at Crow's Shadow, or if you pay attention to the work of James Lavador, Betty Phoebus is part of those stories. If you know or think about 1% for the arts programs, that is from Betty Phoebus as well. So there are countless people who she mentored, drove to music classes, took on hikes to dig clay, and encouraged to find their own strengths in different generations. And you probably didn't even realize that she's already a part of your life. I first learned Betty's name in 2004 when I interviewed to be the curator at Museum of Contemporary Craft. And uh, it was from two artists, Jerry Grimm and Manya Shapiro. And eight years and many, many hands and many, many minds later, we produced Generations Betty Fevers in 2012, an exhibition and a publication of the same name. And I'm honored to be a part of this new look at her work and really, really hope that all of you who are able to go and see the exhibition in person will mask up and make the trip because it is, it is work that really begs to be seen in person. Um, I want to also uh, thank you, uh, Ryan and Kristen and Squeak and Mark for all of the work behind the scenes that put, went into putting this program together and also Robin Held for some of the connections over time that led to our, our working together today. So I wanna be really clear about what we're gonna be doing today. And what I'm doing is a combination of things. I'm trying to give a bit of a history of Betty Fevis's work. I'm trying to touch on a couple of key things in her life that connect to the department at Washington State University. And I'm also trying to share images with you because I know that some of you may not be in, may, may be joining us from places where you're not going to get to see the exhibition. And I want to make sure you have some of the images in your head. So there's a couple of different things that are going to be going on. Um, the other thing I want to let you know is that we're going to walk through a couple of different touch points. Uh, Betty's growing up, Washington State, entering Washington State University her time with Alexander and Archipenko, um, working with Clifford Still, and then her time at Design Technics. So these are kind of the five things we're gonna be moving through today. And what I'm gonna be doing is touching on each of these chronologically, like in, in sequence of when it happened for her, but then I'm gonna take you on a journey into um, sort of moving through the decades of her work. So I'm mentioning that because it's not gonna follow a very linear path and I wanna make sure that you all are aware of that. So you don't go, wait a minute, that work doesn't look like something that happened back then. And I just wanna make sure everyone is with me as we go through. So let's start with growing up, family, education and community. So with the exception of a few years, Betty Whiteman Phoebus lived in the rural farming areas of Oregon and Eastern Washington. Betty said in, in 1980 that most of my images are female images. It may be a clue I took from Clifford Still. He said he was painting his autobiography and in a sense, everything is a self portrait. That's the way I feel about it. I want you to keep that in mind as we go on this journey through her work about what a self-portrait actually can be and whether these images convey a sense of how Betty structured her life and her, her portrait of herself through her work. So if we take Betty Fevers at her word that her work is self-portraiture, then understanding how she became an artist, teacher, mother, community advocate, and mentor begins with the place her feet first touched the ground. Betty Whiteman Fevers was one of four children and she was born in 1918 and passed away in 1985. And after a fire burned the family home to the ground, her parents, Otis and Edna Whiteman, moved everyone to farmland located near Edna's family in Palouse River country in Eastern Washington. It was less expensive than the land near Athena where they had been living. And the couple and their two oldest sons were able to purchase nearly three times as much land near La Crosse, Washington. In the summer following Betty's birth, the family moved to a rented house in Walla Walla, Washington, so the older boys could attend school. Education was a priority in the Whiteman household. And uh, Edna was a former school teacher. 
and the relocation to Walla Walla put them in close proximity to Whitman College and its Conservatory of Music. Very social, very gregarious, Edna actively participated in many of the women's social and service organizations, bridge clubs, book groups, music appreciations, evenings, and the American Association of University Women. And I'm mentioning all of these because I think it's important to get a sense of what kind of family um, we're talking about. We're talking about a family that has generations of college education, that has a certain amount of affluence, and is a family of white European origin that is sitting in a, a space that is um, reflective of being accomplished, an accomplished uh, woman, an accomplished individual. Um, a modern equivalent could be somebody who listens to NPR every morning and, um, and so forth and is, is joining different book groups and things like that could be kind of a, a contemporary version of, of these circles that she was, was working in. So the family relocated in 1921 into a home on Fern Avenue in Walla Walla. And uh, in 1924, um, Viva's uh, father leased the farm for a five year period and sold his equipment to a renter, but the tenant didn't take care of everything. And in 1930, with that compounded by the Great Depression, the family ended up moving from Walla Walla back to La Crosse. And Jack and Betty attended high school in La Crosse, Jack as a senior and Betty as a freshman. Uh, the small school of around 250 students served the families in the surrounding area and completely confounded the independent Betty Whiteman. She said, when I went to high school in this little one horse town, they wanted me to take home economics. And I'd had that in seventh and eighth grades in Walla Walla, lots of sewing, embroidered things and all that crap. I didn't want to take home economics. What I wanted to do was take shop. They wouldn't let me. Girls couldn't take shop. I thought that was kind of rookie. And there in La Crosse, they had a pretty good teacher. And by the time they were seniors, they were turning out some pretty fancy stuff, dining room tables and you know fancy chests and really, really good looking furniture. Girls had to take a home economics. They said, you can take art an art class. You can come down here and in this little anteroom off of the shop, you can draw pictures. So I copied crap and charcoal and got some credits. I decided that I was going to be an artist. And this is a conversation she had in 1984 with her children, Julie and Michael Phoebus. What I really appreciate is here is this young woman who wasn't allowed to take shop class and ended up having no less than five or more kilns going at a given time on her property that she built herself with help from Hal Rieger or different assistants. She engineered a number of different pieces, sculptures that went up on walls, um, figured out how to build towering pieces. So the fact that she didn't have shop class, shop class certainly did not keep her um, from getting her hands into engineering and construction. So let's move to Washington State University. And I wanna pause, oops, I wanna pause for just a moment um, to give a bit of a context for the type of art department that Betty Phoebus was, uh, Betty Whiteman, excuse me, was entering. Professor Worth D. Griffin became the chairman of the Department of Fine Arts in 1933. And this marks a shift from traditional realism and impressionism to what is now known as the modern movement and often referred to as expressionism. And, and I'm reading this directly from material that Ryan shared with me that talks about the history of the department. And this gives you a bit of an example of some of the kind of regional work that was um, going on in the 1930s to give you a sense of, of these shifts that are happening in, around um, the context of the department. So the first BA in fine arts were awarded at Washington State University as early as 1920, with the first MA degree in fine arts awarded around 1929. So the first MFA in degree in fine arts was authorized somewhere between 1937 and 1941. I don't have the exact date and the information I got had two different, different times. So somewhere in there is when the very first MFA was awarded from the university. Now this context is important when you're thinking about the Betty Whiteman's time at Washington State University, 
because it was a time of transition between ways of working, representation into expression and abstraction, as well as a time in which the department and academia was shifting in terms of degree granting at the institutional level. So Clifford Still was awarded an MA from Washington State University in 1935. And Howard Singerman in his book, Art Subjects, notes um, that his path was not very common, but it definitely signaled a shift to the kind of BFA and MFA paths that we see today. Now in 1936, for example, the year after he earned his MA, and this is during the time Betty was, was attending the school, there were only 18 of the 483 art schools, college departments, and independent studios listed in the American Art Annual that offered any graduate degrees in art or art education. So hopefully that gives you a sense of how radical and um, forward thinking this was for this institution to be thinking along these lines of, of degree um, granting quite early on. And um, moreover, Singerman, ar Singerman argues that Still's education was not yet fully contemporary. His undergraduate degree, he says, was in public school art. And his graduate degree was an MA in art rather than the MFA that they began to offer at the school later. Um, so this is an interesting shift here, thinking about where Clifford Still sits in here in terms of um, education and um, uh, uh, these kinds of shifts that are going on. And um, it also is an interesting shift when you start thinking about other things that are going on across the country. For example, at the same time, we have a number of Bauhaus emigres who are coming to the United States. They're fleeing uh, Nazi Germany and they are coming and teaching in innovative new programs as well as, as academic programs that were not like Black Mountain College and um, the new Bauhaus, which you see some pictures of teaching happening and work happening there. Ani Albers at her weaving studio and Josef Albers teaching a uh, class with the, the beautiful um, mountains behind him. And a picture of Mahali Naj, uh, Naj's new Bauhaus that opened in 1939 in uh, Chicago. So just to give you a bit of a context of what's going on around the country. So Clifford Still was hired um, as a teaching fellow in the fine arts department in 1933, according to Patricia Failing, um, when he, which was when he completed his degree. And so from 1935 to 1940, he held the position of instructor. And course catalogs show that he taught as many as 10 sections of drawing each year from beginning to advanced, in addition to courses in commercial art design, applied design, mural painting, methods of teaching, and watercolor. And by 1938, his teaching assignment cor included courses in art history, and he also served as the faculty advisor to the campus camera club. Betty Whiteman entered WSU in the fall of 1935, and her time there coincides directly with Still's teaching time. And while we cannot know for sure which of the art classes she took from him, we know through letters with her friend Alice, who was nicknamed Burke, uh, that they studied painting with Still in their senior year. And based on that lengthy list of courses that Still was responsible for, it's safe to presume that Still taught Betty more than once during her time at Washington State University. What he was teaching and how he was teaching was a very, very different way um, than what was going on in other parts of the, 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 the world and the country. And um, what was happening in most places was a carryover of a European method of the séance de correction. So it's basically the idea that the, the instructor is the master, the master comes in, the master will correct your line literally on your paper, will physically be engaged in correcting your work um, right in front of you. And Hans Hoffmann, who brought modernism to the United States also as, along with a number of these other emigres was notoriously part of this kind of corrective um, behavior approach. Clifford Still had a very different approach and um, his approach was not to take brushes away or, in, or um, to insert himself in a student's process of making but rather to talk with the student 
when the student felt that the work was at a place where um, there would be a, a way to have a conversation about it. So it was about, as Betty Phoebus said, it was about feelings. It was about what the work was doing, what the work was trying to say. And this is a dramatically different um, approach from what was going on in many other uh, art teaching um, environments at that time. So Howard Singerman mentions that Still's method and his readings of a finished painting back to its maker so that the student artist project might be refined and extended is this teaching of painting by crit, Singerman calls it. And this is what we understand to be a crit method today. Um, now, I will be honest with you, I have a lot of conversations with people when I go in to participate in crits. Um, very, very, very rarely does a school say to me, here is our approach to the crit method. This is how we do crits at our school. Um, it's, there's a lot of assumptions now, 100, nearly 100 years later, about how a crit takes place. And so we're seeing this moment where this method that we know really well is starting. And I think right now, particularly with um, COVID, with attention to um, diversity and different perspectives, we're at this really interesting pivotal moment where there may be some really different kinds of methods of, of engaging students happening um, going forward in the next few years. Now, I wanna be really clear that um, Singerman and neither Singerman nor I are saying that um, Clifford still developed the crit approach, but he's definitely teaching in a crit style or in a style of, of conversation that's about talking about the work rather than focusing on techniques or methods. And that's, um, he's part of a larger group of people who are doing that. So uh, one of Betty's fever, Bet yeah. <laughs> that's a hard, Betty fevers comes out every now and then. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, one of Betty's teachers and friends who uh, also taught at the school was William Fortune Ryan. And um, Ryan left Washington State University to join Cameron Booth in founding the St. Paul Academy of Arts after Betty's sophomore year. And at the time of his departure, Ryan turned over his commission to complete the Stations of the Cross for the newly built Sacred Heart Church in Pullman to the 19-year-old Phoebus. So this series of panels, there are 14 panels, they were carved in pine and they were her first commission. They remain on view in the church today. Um, the opportunity not only introduced the young Phoebus to a broader public, but it also provided the first opportunity to consider narrative, the figure in space, and catalyzed her shift from painting to three-dimensional form. Betty would go on after she finished at Washington State University to spend some time in Minneapolis with Ryan and Boot at the St. Paul Academy. And from a letter from her close friend, Burke, to Leonard Kimbrell, who is a professor emeritus at Portland State University, we learned that, that the medium that Betty was working with in when she was in Minneapolis was gouache. She was really trying to work on color and extending her palette. Um, but what's really interesting in this letter is to note that she says she, uh, Burke said she was still under Still's influence and she was using the earth colors, preparing them from the dry colors and using a palette knife rather than brushes. And I want you to keep that idea about this natural materials, preparing them and how that comes back up again in her work as we, as we go through looking at some of her, um, the development of her work and process. So Alexander Archipenko. So now we're gonna map a bit of turning the Alexander Archipenko way into the Betty Fevis way. Now, Alexander Archipenko did not teach like Clifford Still. Um, when you studied with Archipenko, as Betty Fevis put it, you did things the Archipenko way. So she's got this contrast going on in her schooling, right? She's got Clifford Still introducing feelings and emotions and expression. And then she's got Archipenko saying, this is how you do it. This is, it. This is the way to work. So she's got this going on at the same time. Um, so to help you understand Archipenko's connection and why she was working with Archipenko, I'm just gonna give you, read to you a little bit of some of, of Betty's description. She says she was, uh, between her junior and her senior year, she was sort of carving plaster and inching her way into sculpture. And one of her teachers suggested that she go to the University of Washington for summer school because Archipenko was gonna be there. So she studied for six weeks with Archipenko at University of Washington. And that was my first introduction to clay, she says. 
She also says, we didn't do anything in the ceramic sense as I understand it at this point, but we built up pieces solid with armatures and butterflies and all kinds of stuff to hold the clay up. And then once you got it all made, you started cutting windows into it and hollowing it out so that it could be fired. And this was, wow, just a great revelation to me. Now, I want you to think about that when you're looking at these pieces by Archipenko. And what you can see here, particularly in Walking Woman, you can see there how he's gone in and he's removed material from a block of clay. And you can see it, uh, especially with the other two as well. Um, but this is the kind of hollowing out that you will see in some of Betty's pieces. It's also the kind of way of building up um, building your form by pulling material away. So it's a, a, a reductive process rather than an accumulative process. Um, the other thing I want you to see here is that there's a lot of mimicry of other materials. The walking woman piece looks like it's, it's made to look like it's bronze. Um, and the other two pieces seem to mimic stone in some way. This was something that Archipenko was very known for was masking the materials if he was using plaster or wood or um, or, or clay to do something to cover the surface so that you didn't really know what the materials were. And this is something that Betty was working with a bit um, as she went forward. And this is a piece of hers where you can really see that kind of approach that's about carving the stone and uh, carving from a block and actually mimicking the stone as well with this, this head. What's interesting here is you start to see the clay peeking out. You start to see a little bit of the way she's using, she's strategically painting the glaze on in such a way that um, the, the, the flecks from the clay start to look like the freckles on the person's face and there's a lot of texture going on. So she's starting to play around with showing the clay itself here. Now, in 1952, she had two exhibitions. She had an exhibition or pieces in two exhibitions, one on the East Coast at the Syracuse National, and then she had another piece at the um, Oregon Ceramic Studio Biennial. And this is the piece that, that was entered in there. And again, here, you really can see how she started with a block. This was something where she's carved out the material. And I've seen this piece in person, and it very much fits with this mimicry of stone kind of thing that was a very Archipenko way of working. Um, and then, you know, in order to understand this idea of cubism, um, I want to flip through a couple of images really quickly. And I want you to imagine that you are walking around the piece or you're taking in the piece from different angles. And this is really the way in which Archipenko's work as a cubist operated. It was about showing multiple perspectives simultaneously within the same piece, which is really hard to do over Zoom and in a slide. So let's play with this for just a minute. And as we go through, I want you to pay attention to the surface. And I want you to pay attention to the relationship between that drawn line that you see there of the arm and the hollowed out area and the way that it moves through. Okay, I just love the way you look through the back and you can actually see the line of the hand, which is just gorgeous. Now I want you to think for a minute, if you're looking at the piece I just showed you, how much movement and motion there is in there, as opposed to this piece, which is very static, it's very frontal, it's very formal. There's a front and a back. But I also want you to see how Betty was working through drawing. She was playing around with drawing as a way, as she put it in one of the interviews, she said it was a way to, oh, she, told, she told Bob Landman that it's a way to get the crap out because then you're experimenting with your drawing. So when you're actually working with the, the other kinds of materials, you know what you want to do. And this is a piece that is in the 1960s. And it's a completely different way of thinking about hollowing out the form of the, about the relationship between a head and a body um, and a figure. Uh, and then we start to see other places where there's this experimenting with glazes, with this very painterly approach to the glaze and the clay peeking through and a female figure, very much a female figure. 
again, more female figures with attention to hips. Um, Betty was a short and a short woman with ample hips. And you start to see that in these figures as you go forward too. I believe this one is sitting, this one is right behind Ryan um, in the exhibition. <laughs> And these are some of the watercolors that are in her sketchbooks. Her sketchbooks are amazing. They are, are just, they're full of drawings. And she would spend the evenings while the kids were working on their homework or they were um, practicing their music, she would draw at the table. So it was a way that she could keep her work portable and take it with her. Some more images. These are also images that are related to some of the cairn forms that, that um, connect to the landscape um, that are in the exhibition. So in terms of process, what she's talking about clay as she knows it is more this kind of process. This is what she came to after working through Archipenko style. She starts working with um, slab construction and using a roller to lay out to, to um, create these slabs and then actually cut and shape and paddle and push with her fingers and create these architectural structures that get larger and larger and larger. And so she learned about structure building through Archipenko, but she's taking this into a very, very different kind of place in her work. Um, this is a, a shot uh, from one of her apprentices. She had a lot of apprentices over the years and um, they, they really helped her uh, get the bigger and bigger sculptures um, and structures and get them into the kiln. So here's a shot of her um, finishing the work down in her basement. Her entire basement, it was a daylight basement and it was entirely set up for Betty to do her work um, throughout, throughout the time that they lived in that house. So this brings us to Clifford Still. And um, following the summer between her junior and senior years, Fief has investigated a possible transfer from Washington State University to University of Washington but the move would have required additional courses to meet graduation requirements. So she elected instead to remain at Washington State where she and Burke and Clinton Owen, another friend of theirs, enrolled in several classes with Clifford Still. Um, and just to, to give you a sense, and I'll show you a few images of Clifford Still's work in a moment, but for those of you who may not be familiar with Clifford Still, he's recognized today as one of the earliest of the abstract express expressionist painters of the mid 20th century. Now, I cannot tell you how exciting it was when we're flipping through this album, and I did not know that Clifford Still had taught, it, uh, taught her at Washington State University, and there it says Professor Still. And it's just like, as a curator, it's like these moments where you go, oh yeah, this is so, so cool that I, this is the kind of thing you get to see and to find, and then you start to unpack from there. What does it mean? Who is this person? How is it connected? What's going on here? Um, and so, so starting with this set of snapshots, I'm gonna move you through a series now of Stills paintings and use Alice's, um, uh, Burke's letter, uh, or excuse me, to use, um, yeah, Burke's letter to Leonard Kimbrell as a way of framing what's going on. So the paintings you're gonna see from Still are from 37, 38, and then go into much later work. But this will give you a sense of what it must have been like for Alice and, um, and Betty when they were, were studying with him. So Alice says that, um, I think that all is necessary from, to know about me, she tells Leonard, is that I was a student at Washington State University. The four years I've rented a studio in Pullman our senior year and took art seminars with the work being done at the studio. So this, this studio is basically a bedroom on the second floor of a home of a friend of her mother's. And we took down the bed and set up our easels. There was a small cast iron stove for heating and Clifford Still was the instructor. Mr. Still received the work we selected for him and only observed the amount of work turned from the wall that we were doing. Experimenting and trying out ideas was what he wanted, not finished displayable works of art at the student level. His interest and enthusiasm was like a shot in the arm. He believed that every person developed in this way. Also, he was sensitive to the nth about his degree about his own work and treated us just as sensitively. Now, not only was Lou supportive, um, Burke says uh, about, uh, for, about Betty, 
But Betty's family was willing to see that she was able to go and study in St. Paul and later in New York. They paid her way and kept her in supplies. Without that support and financial assistance, she could not have made it between college and lose support. This is important because you if you're going to make a living as an artist, you have to find a way to feed yourself and clothe yourself and have a room or roof over your head. And the way that she did this was because she did have financial support from her family and that transi transitioned into financial support from Lou Phoebus, who was a physician. So her life was structured in a way that permitted her to keep working in the way that she did. Um, to return to the letter, at least that was my experience. And here Alice is talking about herself. Maybe I'm projecting. Being able to stay in the field is important having one's hands in it and mind active regarding art. You asked why Still painted such huge canvases. Did, he did I tell you, he said, I entered a painting in a competitive exhibit at the Metropolitan in New York and they sent it back because of its size. By God, someday I'll make them take down the doors to get one of my paintings in. And it's safe to say that I think many museums would take down their doors to get a giant Clifford Still painting in. Um, and uh, uh, this is one painting that I wanted to share with you because this is one that I grew up visiting at the Manil Collection in Houston. Um, and I, I just love, I love the way that that circles around in experience. And so my entree into Phoebus's work now is coming through what I remember experiencing looking at this, these abstract paintings. Um, Phoebus also shared a story in 1980 that she graduated in 1939. And, and at that time, Clifford was doing his quote, absol absolutely magnificent abstracts, which he wouldn't show to anybody. But once in a while, if you were a special favorite, he'd take you in and flip through 50 paintings in about half an hour. And uh, so that was, I, I, I know she got the opportunity to see some of these, but that very controlled environment of sharing work is an interesting, um, interesting thing to think about. So I want you to think about um, this application that we talked about earlier about applying paint with a palette knife and that she learned this from Clifford Still. She learned from Still to mix and make her own paints and materials. And um, in her files, what's really interesting is she has recipes for mixing paints. Um, the, the recipe that you see here is from Betty Fevis, and the box that you see here is Clifford Still's paint box. That's not hers. That's actually Still's paint box um, from the Clifford Still Museum in Denver. Um, now, when Betty was making this, she was learning out of necessity because you have to understand that at the time that um, that Betty Fevis is making this work, uh, there aren't places to buy clay. And, and Oregon Ceramic Studio in Portland was one of the only suppliers of clay and small kilns and things like that. There was no Georgie's, there was nothing. So she had to figure out if she was going to do this work, how to make that happen. Um, but what's really interesting is how in her life, her necessity develops a clay body and an approach to glazes that becomes her aesthetic. It becomes part of the work itself for her. And um, it ties in with this, this love of land and alchemy and process um, that, and, and a connection to that palette of these earth colors coming through in other ways. So Phoebus began to develop her own clay body out of necessity, right? And so she would purchase this brick clay from Legrand and mix it with local clay. And countless family members and friends and communi community members over the years have shared stories with me about how they would go on digs with Betty Phoebus to find clay. And they marveled that she just knew where to find the clay. Now, here's the thing. Um, when I was, uh, I worked for a while as a, a, a research ethnographer in a design firm. And one of the things we looked at was user behavior. And I asked if there was a box that was the box that had all the stuff that she kept nearby. Because all of us have a couple things that we keep nearby that are sort of your go-to things. And they said, oh yeah, there's a box. And so in the box was a Rolodex with clay splatters all over it. 
and um, it had recipes in it from um, from Bernard Leach and uh, Daniel Rhodes and a number of other other people. And there was a, a, a folder that had maps. And when I pulled out these maps, I realized these maps are the geological survey maps of Oregon and Washington. So she wasn't just finding clay, she was systematically going out and taking her friends and building community to go out and have an adventure and dig the clay together and then have people to work with when she came back because at the time she was literally the only person working this way and working as an artist in Pendleton for years and years and years. So she found a way to turn this into um, acquisition for the materials she needed and a fun way to develop community and friendships along the way. And what happens is she, um, so this picture that I started with in the basement, that is basically this set of test tiles. So I started noticing that the numbers on the back of these test tiles started to correspond to the, the different places that were on the maps, Dead Man's Pass, et cetera. And so we, that's when we realized that she was systematically not only testing clay bodies, but she was also testing glazes at the same time. And this really, really came through when we had a conversation with Bob Landman, who was one of her assistants twice before he went to Alfred University and then after, after that. And Bob had this way of looking at her work. And I'm just going to run through some images of her work while I, while I share this with you. Bob had this way of looking at a cup and saying, well, this cup, for instance, that glaze is made with lawn grass ash. The brown comes from Dead Man's Pass. And I see a piece over on the wall there, over there, that platter, that glaze is made with locust ash. Betty would take and burn the branches and then process the ash. And that glaze was also made with locust ash. He also shared that Betty had a friend at the University of Oregon who would do analysis with her. And basically they sent off some, some of the uh, clay that they, have dug, they had dug um, for analysis and it came back with a similar structure to feldspar. And they realized they had a plastic feldspar which is very similar to what uh, Chinese porcelain is made from or is you, the, the composition of Chinese porcelain. And so this was something that they were starting to experiment quite with quite a bit um, more in the 80s and closer to the time when Betty passed, passed away. Uh, Bob also said there's an outside fireplace here and Betty would burn stuff out there and I can remember her calling the fire department and saying, hey, I'm going to be doing a burning up here. It's just my fireplace in the back, so you don't need to send a fire truck. And I heard that story over and over again from people who said they had to make sure that she had to phone them and say, don't, don't send them, it's just me burning some things. Um, as, as Bob went through the materials, he also started to identify different recipes. He could tell what the recipes were and her shorthand was. So there was this great communication between her and the apprentices in terms of processing and, and developing the materials. So this brings us to design techniques. And this is the time when she was in New York. She was earning her degree at Columbia uh, University. And um, she's working in a pottery studio. And I just wanted to share with you that there's some wonderful materials that the family has that are focused on, um, that are, are ephemera with, with information about what the cost of her materials were for her classes. Um, for example, here, something that cost a dollar at that time, I did some calculations and it would be about $18 for the same, um, same rubber mold materials today. And um, I think it's interesting to think about what someone would be studying in the summer of 1941 as World War II was getting started. And one of the courses she was working through was the decline of economic liberalism and looking at raw materials and population in world politics. And what really struck me at looking at this is the way it presents a very global perspective of the subject. Um, and uh, uh, it really situates you in the, the moment in which she was living. So 
there are some letters that the family has that were back and forth between um, Burke and Betty. And this is where Betty is describing just walking into this place in, in the village, in Greenwich Village, and finally getting enough courage to basically ask if she could have a job. And this was the Design Technics store. Now, the thing to think about um, with Design Technics is at this time, it was very, very difficult for uh, people to go into massive amounts of production. In fact, Russell writes, um, there were some of Russell Wright's uh, uh, endeavors, for example, he's the one who developed uh, Fiesta Wear, and some of Russell Wright's projects got, got waylaid by the war because materials had to be sent off in a different way. Um, but she's working at this, this place at, called Design Technics. She worked there for three years, and it gave her a chance to work with all different kinds of kilns, to, um, to learn how to fix things as she went along, to work with people through production. So you get that communal kind of, of engagement of producing things. And it really taught her a lot about business and producing everyday kinds of, of, um, of vessels and, and things for, for use in different ways. This is also the time when she met her husband, Lou. Um, they married secretly and then came back to Pendleton um, Lou was uh, Lou was Jewish, and this caused some consternation for her mother. And eventually, that worked itself out. But it was a bit of a problem for a while. And so this was this was um, this was why they kept it secret for some time. This image you see here is Betty and two of her her coworkers at Design Technics, and she calls the photograph um, the original hippies on the back. And these are some of the kinds of pieces that were being produced at Design Technics. And then these are some of the pieces that Betty produced on her own. And she said that she would make some of these pieces basically to satisfy the kids when they needed, needed things or the shop up the street needed some things. Um, but for Betty, again, to emphasize, you know, the, the, there was no difference between this work and her sculptural work. The glazing, the clay bodies, the way she approached it, all of it was the same. Now I wanna come back to Still really briefly and say that in the, during the time she was in New York, Still actually did go to visit with her, but she never went to his studio. She was furious with him. Um, and the reason that she was really angry with him is because one of the things that happened is that Still, Still used to get very frustrated with women who were talented and showed um, a possibility of being very serious with, art, with their artwork and knowing that they were going to protect, probably most likely going to become housewives and not be able to pursue their work. And it felt like a futile effort for him. So he would, and he was, was very vocal about this. And this created some tension with Betty where she felt that she needed to find a way to, um, to work with the constraints around her, but also be able to be an artist. And um, in some of the correspondence with Burke, you can see where she's getting really angry and she just, she's, she doesn't want to see still. And to my knowledge, she never did spend time with him again. So she revisited all of the folks who taught her technical skills, but she never came back to the person who taught her to think about what it means to be an artist, to live like an artist, to work like an artist, to be serious in a way that, um, that she wanted to be also in her life. And yet at the end in 1980, um, closer to the end of her life, she returns to Clifford Still and says, most of my images are female images. It may be a clue I took from Clifford Still. He said, it was, he, said he was painting his autobiography and in a sense, everything is a self-portrait. That's the way I feel about it. So it was the conceptual aspects, the thinking, um, trying to locate herself in a different sort of way in relationship to the materials and the work she, and what she was trying to say is where Still ended up coming into view. Um, I just wanted to end with a few shots of her working, one on the wheel, one with her building, and um, to remind you of the autobiography being not just about her working with the materials, but the materials themselves and the connection between the materials and community. This particular uh, photograph was taken by Jackson Patterson, who is um, Jinx Patterson's son and Betty Feebles' nephew, I think. Um, 
and might be great nephew, forgive me, I forgot the relationship, but um, he is a photographer. And for him growing up, knowing Betty as an artist had a huge impact on his life. And he came to uh, the area and took these photographs, which we used as murals for the exhibition. And I think we should end on a really great sassy shot of Betty Fevers and Lou Fevers. Um, they were both incredibly independent and they worked well together and together they made it possible for Betty to do her work. So with that, I'm gonna end there. Thank you so much, Namita. That was wonderful. I'm going to welcome uh, Sweek Meisel into our conversation. Um, and we have had one question so far in our um, in our chat. So I'll just make a note of that and then I'll um, see what Squeak wants to start with. But we have the head of our Manuscripts, Archives and Special Collections asking about your sources for the photos and um, your sources for, you know, I think gaining access to her work and all these materials. You told me a bit about it when we first talked on the phone and it was fascinating to hear how you first came to exploring Betty Fiva's work. Um, so if you wanna chat about that for a minute and then the head of Fine Arts Now for us at Washington State University Squeak, please join in too. <laughs> Well, Namita, if you want to answer that, you can. I guess I just want to thank you. Um, it's wonderful to have such a wonderful human being talking about another wonderful be human being. I think that um, you feel like Columbo in this investigation, like finding things. Maybe you can answer Trevor's question through that a little bit. <laughs> it definitely felt like Columbo. Um, I was thinking of it as Nancy Drew, but I like Columbo because, you know, I like that jacket. Um, so uh, there's, yeah, I mean, it takes time to build relationships and Alan and Julie were incredibly generous and very trusting and gave me access to cabinets and drawers and personal albums. And, um, you know, that's where a lot of these images are, are coming from. Um, some of the photographs are photographs that were taken by Dan Kovitka in Portland. Um, uh, but, but a number of the older archival images, those are coming from, from the family and collections. Um, we gathered some images from a few sources like the American Craft Council, um, a few museums, but for the most part, it, it was the family really just letting us go through things and, um, trusting that we would take care of them and be honest with them about what we might want to do with them. And that, that segues nicely into some of my thoughts about you talking about some of, some of the barriers that she had, you know, structural barriers. Um, we're up against our own structural barriers now in a similar kind of pinchy place in politics and all kinds of things. And it seems really appropriate to hear about somebody who had that ferocity, but also the support of family and partners that wanted to help her move forward. Um, I found that really uh, inspiring, especially knowing that the majority, of, like our fine arts demographic as students is 73% is, uh, female now. And so it, it seems like that's a, a positive shift in, in structure to some degree, but can you speak a little bit to, you know, it sounds like she was a real master contortionist trying to figure out how do I find a way to get to this thing I love? Um, is that accurate in my understanding? You know, I think, it feels like when I look at it, I imagine it requiring a lot of contortions. And yet there's this great, there's this great um, piece of writing that Hal Rieger did after Betty passed away. And he said that going up to her house, you know, they had four kids and she's working during the day. She's getting food on the table. She's getting lunch taken care of. And he said, it seemed like it was a three ring circus, but everything was just seamless and just happened. And you know, I think that that she mentions in a couple of places that she did have some help from time to time with laundry and cleaning and other things. And that she realized as soon as the kids, you know, it was very hard when the kids were little, but once the kids were old enough that they were in school, she felt like she had a freer amount of time and they were some more self-sufficient. So she adjusted her work. That's why her work didn't come out into public until 52 because she was raising kids. Um, 
and I mean, I shouldn't say just raising kids. That was when she was raising kids when they needed to be at home and then they were in school and that gave her some freedom. Um, but I think that, you know, someone like, like Betty Phoebus um, or Betty Whiteman, let's say, they would have been expected to get married pretty quickly right out of school. And, and she got the family support to go to, Min to Minneapolis for a year and then to be in New York City for three years in the middle of World War II. I mean, that's kind of incredible. And um, I think that, I mean, my sense from what I've, I've learned is that Lou structured things to let her be able to do that work. I mean, they built a house with a modernist architect um, specifically so that she would have that daylight basement and be able to work down there and could build kilns on the, on the property. And so I think that there was an understanding that um, for them to be in a relationship together meant he, he, needed to, he needed to help support in those other ways. Um, she, she also did a lot of, she did exhibit a lot during, you know, during the 50s and 60s and, and, and following that, but you know, she had work at Museum of Modern Art, she had work in, in places in Europe, she was all over the place, and then it got to a point where she, she just was like, you know, I've done that, it's not really satisfying me, so I'm just going to do what I need to do, and I can make enough money to work by selling things locally. And um, then she started doing these architectural installations. So she got to go bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I think that, that the contortion thing is really about adjusting the other things so that she could make that happen and, and having support. She had support. Yeah, the support seemed huge. Every time I interview an artist, uh, it almost 100% of the time they have supportive people behind them. You know, they, yeah. are, they believe in, and listen, and and um, that kind of takes us to one of the questions that's in the in the chat here about you know thinking about community and how you leverage your community to be a supportive space. Whether, like you said, they went on adventures, um, mm -hmm. looking for materials. Do you have a broader sense of of how she built that, or? Um, yeah, you know, she built community. I, I have to say that all of us who worked on this project felt that we learned about building community in new ways just through the way people talked about her. Hmm. You could talk to five people who knew her and every one of them will tell you about an experience where she was completely focused on them and helped them see something about themselves. So even when she was doing all this work, she always had time to have fresh mint tea with Jinx and talk to her about poetry and reading and things like that. And every one of them was different. And I've never had, I get chills. I've never had an experience where every person who's an adult literally almost comes to tears or is crying about how much she helped them see themselves. So I think it was something that was about her. She knew how, she knew how to bring people out and, um, and that brought community with her. And she also, you know, that, that, that upbringing that she had and the kind, of, the kind of responsibilities, volunteer responsibilities her mother had, and then that she took on, you know, she learned to think about things outside of herself. It was about what was gonna be good for the community, what was gonna be good down the road. So developing a Suzuki model and bringing the Suzuki method to Pendleton that was for her kids, but it was really about what does Pendleton need and what does the state need and how can we make things better where we are for everybody? And I think that that's, um, that's something that I think is important right this, right this moment, you know? Yeah. I would, uh, does, that, does that get at what you're wondering? Well, I, I, I hope so. I, it gets to what I'm wondering. And, and I think it also <laughs> dovetails really lovely into my experience of walking into the museum, the, the questioner says yes, um, walking into the museum for the first time since COVID kind of made us all turtle up a little bit, right? And to walk in there, and Ryan was generous enough to let a, a few of us in at a time, and now I know people can have access, but to, to like walk up and feel the energy of another human in a material in that way with such a, a kind of a a pause gave me goosebumps. I mean, the, the work itself still holds that energy somehow. And um, 
it's I really appreciated that you shared like that um, three dimensional kind of super slow stop animation. It's a it's a <laughs> challenge for sculpture and three dimensional installation based kind of work, storage, all these kinds of things. And so it's fantastic your family saved these things. And then it's even more fantastic that after being starved a bit, walking in and just thinking, oh my God, I needed this. And um, so I guess this is my gratitude to all of you for making that happen. And I hope that people who are here will really take advantage if they can to, to go experience that because it did give me goosebumps. And you know that's a, a part of your efforts. And I think that my only sadness is not every student's in there, even though I know they have that opportunity. But, um, and those are challenges that we're having right now. Um, I kept thinking about like, that resources can be the enemy of creativity sometimes. And it's, and it's moments like this or like World War II and WPA and all those kinds of things that instigate great creativity. I, I do want to say thanks, Squeak, for the plug for the museum. Um, I remember that visit, Squeak, that was really special. Yeah, for anybody out there who's watching and is now really curious to come and see this exhibition, I will say that we're open you know, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 1 to 4 p.m. There's really clear instructions on how to visit safely. We've got 10,000 square feet for you, and we're only allowing 10 people in at a time, so I think it's a pretty you know, wow. do this safely. But um, do reach out to the museum or take a look at our website if you'd like to come visit the exhibition. Amita, this has just been tremendous. Um, I think we could stay here all night with you. It's been just absolutely fascinating. I can't thank you enough for uh, this evening's presentation. Kristen, I don't know if there's any other questions in the chat at this point, but I was really curious to hear you elaborate further on her work with community as well. So I'm happy to see that, uh, that um, Hallie Meredith had asked that question. Amita, maybe real quick, I mean, would you mind just telling a, a bit more about her connection with James Lavador? And that kind sure, of, I mean, sure. I, I think our audience might be familiar with Crow's Shadow Institute for the Arts as we recently did an exhibition here. Um, we have some Lavadors in our permanent collection, but yeah, anything more you could say on that would be wonderful. Absolutely. So um, the story I heard from Jim is that um, somehow somebody told her that Jim was there in town and that he was doing artwork and that she she needed to pay attention to what, you know, to, to, to go check it out, just take a look and see. And he tells the story that she shows up on his door and says, you know, basically says, I hear you're an artist, Let, you know, let's, let's look, let's talk. And not only did she talk with him about his work, but then immediately started doing different things to help support him in many ways. She started exhibiting with him. And when people would come through town, because um, she was on serving on different boards for the state board and on the governor's, things for the governor and the art commission and things like that, she would bring people over. Um, she knew how, she, she always used her resources to extend a hand and, and, and bring people up. And um, Jim is one of the people who got very emotional and said that Crow's shadow is very much, um, the model is very much about what he experienced in the way that she modeled um, sharing your resources and that sharing your resources doesn't take away from you. It just makes it better for everyone because then people start coming more to Pendleton and finding out more and they wanna know more and they wanna see more. And then there are more people coming who, who, who you know, might be interested in the work. And um, yeah, so that's, that's what happened with Jim. And, and he, he said that it really taught him a lot about, about how to, um, how to be a mentor too. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. And it strikes me that in some ways, like her idea of what it meant to be an artist is, you know, it's expansive. You know, it, maybe it pushed beyond Clifford Stills idea of what it meant to be an artist, right? That it could include family, that it could include all these other messy things in our lives and you could still be serious, right? So. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's why she had such an issue with him. And it comes up in so many different ways. She has this really sort of ambivalent relationship where she gets really angry with him. And then she says, oh, but you know, he, he opened my eyes to something. And um, yeah, and, and I think that, that it's because she she felt it's, she says in somewhere that she felt like he started focusing on the finished object as the thing, 
and and squeak i'm interested in you what you said about going into the space and that you you felt something different and and you know i do think that there is we're at a very different place now even in understanding or thinking about material relationships than even we were in 2012 and i feel like if i was in there there's there it would be hard not to feel all of the all of the hands that may have helped her dig the clay and you know and and if you there's there's a resonance i think that that um that comes through that's that's different and i think that is really different than what's still put forward yeah she uh she definitely keeps the clay even though it's vitrified it doesn't feel vitrified it feels like yeah. it's still organic and alive and plastic and that it takes great care and skill um, and transfer of, of, a, of a conversation between a material. And I, I really appreciated you talking about that kind of relationship of um, her and the land, natural materials, and, and like really thinking about what it was she was touching, um, down to burning her own ash and calling the fire station to, I mean, it sounds like she took care of business, you know? She um, did. And, and you know what's really kind of cool actually is that Bob Landman ended up going, and I can't remember where he went. He went somewhere in the Caribbean. Forgive me, I can't remember where it was. But um, I asked him about that. And I said, so, so what, what happened when you went there? He said, well, I learned about how to use what's right available, what's right here, what's available from Betty. And so I said, well, when you did that, what, what did you produce? Were the glazes different? Were the colors different? Like what was different? And he said, actually, it wasn't that different. Um, it was just more that you, you were learning and you understood that you didn't have to order everything from someplace else. Yeah. It didn't have to come from an urban center or someplace else. I mean, all of our clay, even now on the West Coast, most of our clay comes from back East. There isn't a, a place where it's, it's harvested here. And a lot of the clay deposits in places like Pacific Stoneware used to have a great one. Um, that's been paved over. One of them is paved over. So, you know, we don't have those spaces. They were losing them in, in the few that we had in this area. But, um, but yeah, so, so there's, there's that too of just, um, it's, it's in, in Chicano culture, it's rascuachismo. It's, it's making do with what's at hand, right? And this, I think, is about rascochismo at that very visceral material level of um, what materials do you have? Okay, you've got cut grass. Great. What can you do with it? Amen. That sounds great. Do we have time for one more question? There's one floating here from Avantika on the Portland environment. And if there's evidence of like impact by Betty on that space. Absolutely. Hi, Avantika. <laughs> There's definitely, definitely um, impact on the Portland art scene. Um, you know, the two artists who in, who mentioned her first to me, Jerry Grimm was, um, Jerry Grimm is a ceramist and she was married to Ray Grimm, who founded the ceramic program at Portland State University in 1957. Um, and Manya Shapiro is a fiber artist. And both of them said that Betty Fevis' way of managing her life and her work and how she did things had a huge impact in um, as a role model for them to understand that it was possible to do this, that they didn't have to give everything up um, when they got married and had children. Um, in addition to that, um, there's also uh, uh, just, you know, she exhibited work at Oregon Ceramic Studio um, she juried some of the ceramic annuals and biennials. She was very close with um, Lydia Herrick Hodge and um, Vic Avaki and Ross. So Lydia Herrick Hodge founded Oregon Ceramic Studio and Vic Avaki and Ross was teaching at University of Oregon. And Betty was making the circuit around to different colleges, but also, also um, demonstrating and doing different workshops and things in, in Portland as well. Um, there is a moment when she, uh, the, that um, there was a moment when there was a new director who came in. He only lasted six months and I can't remember his name. He came from back East and um, basically she called to say, hey, I'm supposed to bring my things over. And he said, oh, you're going to need to resubmit slides. And she's like, no, I'm not. So she went over to Fountainhead and started showing with, um, with um, Arlene, uh, with uh, the, uh, the Fountainhead Gallery instead. 
So um, there was that. <laughs> but I think in terms of Portland too, um, Lloyd Center has a really massive uh, wall sculpture. Um, there's a number of collectors in the area who have collected her work that were really helpful when we put our show together. Um, so she definitely had an impact. And, and I, would hope, I would hope that the exhibition in 2012 has a different kind of impact too um, and, and introduced her um, I'm so glad that you all are, have done this exhibition to introduce her work in, in a different way and in a different moment and place. And um, the more it happens, the more stories and the way her, the story can tweak, right? Like I couldn't have talked to you about the educational environment in that way because last time I worked on this project, I was so busy saying, here's who she is. <laughs> And now I could actually say, okay, now let's contextualize it a little bit. So it's different. Fantastic. Yeah. I was wondering if to close, since it's 10 after six, I could ask a question for both Namita and Squeak as people who've been educating artists for a very long time. Namita talked so much about, you know, that the beginning of the shift from physical correction to this teaching through talking, the crit and, now, as someone who's been teaching for not as long as you two, but I feel like semester after semester, my students say, you know, just tell me how to do it. <laughs> tell me what you want me to do. What's the right answer? But can you speak, you know, to your experience with this teaching through talk, talking method? And um, I mean, I think we all have our ideas about its value, of course, but from your two individual perspectives, maybe we could kind of close with your thoughts on that. Namita. You should go. I want to hear what you think, Squeak. So it's it's been interesting to experience the the shifts even in my own time um, of going through school and the difference in crit. And you articulated quite well, I thought, in ways that I hadn't really thought about. And then some of the divides between perspectives on that, you know, that still exist between Archipenko kind of methods and maybe Stills methods, and then there's a million other methods. And I think that what I took from what you were talking about a little bit was that in this time of COVID, that's shifting even more. And the way that we talk about work in these spaces, a lot of times I'm not with the physical thing, or I'm only with one individual having a dynamic conversation with the mask and being as, you know, and so, but I, I do think that students see the value of crit. I think that we're learning to adapt crits. Um, you know, there's the intellectual crit where I dismantle in a formal way and then maybe get into conceptual kind of devices. I know my colleagues have lots of interesting methods that way. I did a crit a couple of weeks ago because I could see them crashing in Zoom where I DJed sounds of what the objects felt like to them. And so, and I watched them kind of get a little lighter because this is tough to be in this space all the time. And so I think as creative people, we're always re-examining and kind of looking at, it's very different than taking an exam where you have to get all the answers right there is no wrong answer, but there's a million of possibilities. And so how do you find the way to chase your own tail, you know, figure out what it is that you're trying to figure out. And I, I think students are in, in my classes and what I'm hearing are doing quite well with exploring still. And so it's kind of fun in some ways. Oh, there's this new way. I find, I, I love that. I love that, that, uh, that, play of um awakening them like you would never you may never have thought about doing an exercise like that with them in another situation because it wouldn't you know this this circumstance is making i feel like it's making us think differently too and recognize um our own possible ways of of engaging that are that are are, are creative too but um there's something about what you just said that that I just feel like, and I, I think it's very different for me that I'm not in a big survey class, right? I think that that would be really, really challenging to lose that connectivity. And I think that would be hard to do, but luckily my classes are smaller. And so we've actually had very different kind of one-on-ones and um, a different way of, of thinking through it. Like it's forced me to think through when I enter into that space with them, what do I want to get to from point A to point B? So it's not about like hitting an agenda of, or a checklist, but 
what other understanding do I want them to get to so that they can then jump off and go do something and then come back and check in? And, um, and for me, that's with writing and, and critical thinking and critical analysis, because my program is, the, is a, you know, at Warren Wilson, the MA in Critical Craft Studies is about history and theory. But, but I think it would work, it works the same with, um, with making too. It's, it's, it's about, about pushing them to where they can kind of run off and, and in a different, it's different, it's different. It's like those most magical hallway conversations that we don't get to have right now. Yeah, that's the that, yeah, that's definitely the hard part. Or the the walk from one crit to the next, where there's decompression and like, what did that mean that they just said? And that's not there anymore. It's zooming from one yeah. person to another, um, and that that changes things. And you know, I, I appreciated you talked about your your lecture style yesterday when we visited, and about there's always more to learn, no matter how old we get, to kind of like explore and and be curious and and figure it out and you know i that that was really inspiring to hear you talk about and um you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting in the next 10 years because as you're talking about the shifts that she was involved in or 20 years you know mm. what will this look like you know there's some things about meetings i appreciate this way more you know and there's some things that i don't yeah. like the, the hallway conversation afterwards so it's a pretty interesting yeah yeah there is there's definitely a pluses and, and minuses all at once it's just different it's just different um but you know Betty Phoebus is a great like uh, she never stopped learning she never stopped trying she never stopped experimenting and and challenging herself is is what I I get the sense of and um and she remained just you know she remained that way and and so that's that's good inspiration to think about in these times to remember that um we can always learn something different and and you know it's going to be it's going to be different on the other end of all of this and and that may not all be a bad thing thank you again for everything so um, all, all three all three of you Thank you all. This was great. Thanks for the, for the great conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Namita. Thank you, Squeak and Kristen. Um, and I just want to thank all of the many people that have joined us. A really lovely number of folks that have joined this presentation. So thank you for being here with us tonight. And I see that Alan Fevis is out there as a participant, the son of Betty. So Alan, thank you for being Alan. here. <laughs> um, with that, uh, I think we can sign off. Um, have a great evening. Uh, take the spirit of Betty Phoebus with you tomorrow, and, um, and uh, it's been great spending this time together. Go to the museum. And go to the museum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>